Good morning, everybody. It is great to see you all. And we are talking today about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And I don't know about you, but my favorite place to be at Thanksgiving is at the table. That's my favorite place. I mean, I love watching football. I love fellowship, playing games, blah, 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 blah. I love all that. But the food, it's all about the food. I love being at the table. But last year was an interesting year, wasn't it? Because we usually, our family goes to 45 different places, and you gain about 30 pounds at the end of a three-day period, and that's Thanksgiving to us. But last year, it was just me, Jane, and the girls. It was crazy. And I just remember, you know, empty chairs and thinking, there's probably a lot of empty chairs this Thanksgiving. You know, empty chairs can represent a lot of things. It can represent a pandemic. It can represent someone overseas serving our country. It can represent divorce. It can represent a loved one passing away. It can represent division in a family. An empty chair can represent a lot of things. But no matter what the reason, that void hurts. That means someone's not there. Today, I'd like to focus on an empty chair that I think many of us leave empty at times. We leave void at times. And if you have a bulletin, you'll see, or you'll see on the screen, this chair is the empty chair of thankfulness. The empty chair of thankfulness. Being thankful is a place that all of us are called to. All of us are called by God to be thankful thankful. Not just once a year when we can sit at the table and eat tons of turkey and ham and pumpkin pie, pecan pie, all that. No. We are actually called by God every day to be thankful for all he's done for us. Every single day. And I hope you've learned that God has given us every reason to be thankful. This week I had the opportunity to go and do a little church service with um, some of the residents at Miller's Mary Manor. And I was talking about being thankful, and one of the gentlemen shared that every day he counts his blessings. Every day he goes through the list of things, the ways that God has blessed him. And he said, you know what? I never run out of things. Never run out of things to be able to say, God, thank you for this blessing. And if we truly look at our life in the context of who God is, what God has done, and let me just say specifically in Jesus Christ, we can never run out of all the ways we are blessed. We should start each day and we should end each day in the chair of thankfulness. Every day we should be thankful. Thankful. Have gratitude in our hearts. The Apostle Paul writes this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. And these are very strong words. This is a huge, huge call for us. He starts by saying, be joyful always. Not just when things are going good, not when you feel like it. No, be joyful always. Pray continually, or as another translation says, without ceasing. We are constantly being in communication and connection with God through Jesus Christ. And then give thanks in all circumstances. At all times, when things are going bad, when things are going good, when you have little or when you have plenty, give thanks in all circumstances. Why? For this is God's will. Secondly, for you in Christ Jesus. This is how we are to live. God deserves this. This is not just once a year, but every day entering the gates of God's presence with thanksgiving and entering his courts with praise. But the reality is, is that many times we fail to sit in the chair of thankfulness. I do too. I do too. There's a lot of times I'll sit in a chair of complaining, chair of being unsatisfied, focusing on negative things, and I miss that chair of thankfulness. So why do we lack thankfulness? Why is our gratitude shallow and conditional? 
Reminds me of a story that I heard. And this is a story about a lady that went to visit this farm. She'd never been to this farm before. And she pulled up the drive and she saw this very peculiar thing, never seen before. It was a three-legged pig. And not just a three-legged pig, but this pig had a wooden leg. Okay? And she goes and meets the farmer and asks some questions about the farm, just trying to find out more about uh, their operation there. And she said, I do have one question. What is the story about this pig? And the farmer said, well, this pig is amazing. Not long ago, we had a fire in our house in the middle of the night, and this pig oinked so loud that woke us up. We were able to put the fire out, and everyone was saved. And the lady was like, that is an amazing pig. Unbelievable. And the farmer said, well, it doesn't stop there. Because there was another time recently when my youngest daughter fell in the pond, and the pig oinked so loud that we ran and were able to save our little girl. And again, the woman was like, I I have never in my life ever even heard of such a thing. She said, but I still don't understand why this pig has a wooden leg. The farmer said, well, when you have a pig that special, you don't want to eat it all at once. (laughs) Gratitude did not run very deep for that three-legged hero, right? Gratitude didn't run very deep. But aren't we the same so many times? We feel blessed when we are blessed. We are grateful when things are going great. We are thankful until time lapses or trials come. And again, I, I'm, in, I'm in the same, same shoes here. It is so easy for us. But I want to look at today why we miss the chair of thankfulness. And how we can resolve that and spend time every day, every moment in a position of gratitude and thankfulness to God. We're going to do so by looking at a familiar story. A parable that Jesus taught. Luke chapter 15. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 15, 11 through 32. It's going to be on the screen. But what we're going to do is we are going to look at this probably one of the most famous parables. And we're going to see the errors of the ways of one of the characters in this and really learn for ourselves how we can be in that place of thanksgiving. Let's start. Luke 15, starting in verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. No three-legged pigs, I don't think, but he went to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up. He went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. 
So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So we get this picture of this celebration, this feast that has been set because of the return of the prodigal son. And the older brother's in the field, and he comes back, and they tell him what's going on, but in anger, he refuses to go. In this situation, there was an empty chair. The empty chair of thankfulness. And the empty chair, if you notice, thankfulness belongs at the Father's table. And the brother refused to go in. He refused to not only celebrate the return of his brother, but he refused to be in the presence of the Father. So let's look at several verses in this story to see what other chairs... This is metaphorically, okay? What other chairs the brother chose to sit in instead of thankfulness? What other chairs, what other attitudes, positions of his heart he chose to rest in instead of celebrating his brother, instead of being thankful and celebrating his presence with the Father? The first chair. The first chair is the chair of coveting. The chair of coveting. The chair of coveting. Now, this is a chair that actually is easy to find when we're young. Um, I want what Timmy has. I want what Susie has. And, you know, you, you look at what someone else has and you want that. Coveting, by definition, is to desire what belongs to another. Coveting is actually one of the Ten Commandments that God spoke through Moses in Exodus twenty seventeen. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, that can be changed in culture today. You should not covet, desire someone else's car or their house or their retirement plan or their health or their whatever, whatever, whatever. Well, coveting was the first chair the older brother found that kept him from the table with the father. Coveting was the first place he found instead of celebrating his brother's return. We see that in Luke 15, 29 through 30. When he said to the father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Instead of celebrating his brother's return, he was focused on what his brother got and what he didn't get. He sat in the chair of coveting. But before he coveted, he fell into the trap of comparing. He fell into the trap of comparing. As soon as we start comparing what we have and what somebody else has, we give way to the sin of coveting. And we quickly lose our position of being content. You see, God's called us to be content. No matter what we have, being able to recognize that we have all we need in God. As soon as we compare, leads to coveting and takes us away from being content. If the older brother was looking at the well-being of his younger brother instead of himself, he would have been at the banqueting table. If he would have focused on his father and the joy and relief 
The burden that had been lifted, thinking his son was dead, but now was alive. If he would have focused on the father, he would have been at the table. Matter of fact, if he would have focused on any one <laughs> except for himself, he would have been at the table. The second chair that we see the older brother choose instead of thankfulness is the chair of greed. Chair of greed. Similar to the sin of coveting, greed is rooted in selfishness. You see a common theme here, selfishness. The older brother was selfish. He was only thinking of himself. And greed also, like coveting, grabs a hold of us even when we're young. My family has, has a, a joke. Um, it didn't start out as a joke, but we have a joke about saying, well, I want two candy bars. And where that came from is when, I, I don't know how old I was, maybe elementary age, my dad took us to the local pharmacy to get something, and we walk in the door, and my dad said, you can all get one candy bar. It's me and my two brothers. Now, I know now that my dad said that because we could afford one candy bar per person. And my dad wasn't really a big fan of greed. He shut that down pretty quick. Well, one of my brothers, I won't say who it is, because I have a brother here in town that's a minister as well, but it might be him. I'm just saying, it might not be. I don't know. So, someone said, hey, Dad, let's get two candy bars. And my dad quickly said, we're getting no candy bars. Get out to the car. And so today, whenever someone in our family um, is not satisfied with something, someone, I mean, it is like time warp, perfect timing. Someone says, well, let's get two candy bars because we were greedy. He was greedy. Someone was greedy. And one candy bar was not enough. Isn't that our culture today? We think more is better. Bigger is better. We're not satisfied. We're not content with what we have. It's more, more, more. Jesus said the following in Luke 12, 15 as a response to a man who was fighting over his inheritance. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. The older brother sat in the chair of greed because what he had wasn't enough. And it's interesting, the father even said to him, all I have is yours. But because he was focused on what the brother got, he was focused on the brother's mistakes, the brother's shortcomings, he wasn't satisfied. He wasn't satisfied. And as a result of greed, he was away from the father's table. The last chair that I want us to look at is the furthest away from the table. And to me, this is the one, um, it's the worst chair to sit in. This is the chair of the orphan. Now, you might be thinking, well, how was he an orphan? There he is. He's got a brother. He's got a dad. How is he an orphan? Well, let me explain it this way. The older brother was not an orphan by circumstance, but by choice. He was not an orphan by circumstance, but by choice. He was not an orphan by the lack of family, but an orphan by the lack of gratitude and love. You see, he had an orphan mindset. He had an orphan attitude. It was not on the father. It was not on his brother. And he was so far away from the father's heart. He was so far away from the father's table. He was so far away from loving his brother because it was all about him. He had a family, but he refused to receive them. That's why in verse 30, he described his brother as, this is this son of yours. He didn't say, my brother. He had an orphan mindset. This son of yours. That's why in verse 31, his father had to remind him, son, you are always with me. 
The son, the father was calling him relationally. But the older brother was so far away relationally. And we also see in verse 29, he referred to his work and service in the family by saying, all these years I've slaved for you. Instead of saying, dad, I work for you because I love you. I'm your son. No, I slaved for you. The older brother's heart, again, was so far away from the younger brother, he couldn't even celebrate his return from death to life. And not only that, he was so far away from the father's heart, he could not see the joy and celebration and enter in to a place, to a chair of thankfulness. You see, the story that Jesus told, we're all the prodigal, aren't we? We all have gone away from God. We've all lived sinful lives. Our sin separates us from God. But through Jesus Christ, Jesus is the path home. And we can come home and we can be forgiven and received. But the other reality is, is we are so often like the older brother that misses the father's heart, misses the father's presence, misses the love for the brother. And see, Jesus' parable gives us a picture of God. God is the one who sets the table. And none of us deserve to sit at the Father's table. But God loves us and has grace, and he invites us in every time, just like he ran to the son returning home and embraced him and gave him everything the son gave up. That is the same love, the same grace that sets a table and says, You are always welcome. You are my child. Come and fellowship with me. So, the thing that we have to ask ourselves is which chair are we sitting in? Again, if you notice each of these chairs, there's only one that's at the table with the Father. There's only one. There's only one. But you might be looking at this and go, oh, I'm good. I don't relate to the orphan. Yeah, I don't like my family or my family, but whatever, you know. Or we can say, oh, I'm not really greedy or, or, you know, what? no, no coveting. But if we're not thankful, we are in another chair. And it might not be represented up here. For some of us, it might be pride. We think that we are all that in a bag of chips and we're always right and everybody's wrong. Guess what? God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. They have a seat at the table. For others of us, others of us might be bitterness, unforgiveness, all types of selfishness. We can sit here and have a whole stage filled with chairs. But the reality is, is that there's only one at the Father's table, and we have to allow the Holy Spirit to convict us in what chair do we find ourselves in so many times instead of thankfulness. And again, I'm not saying this with pointed finger. I'm saying this because I've been there, and I find a lot of different chairs. The whole point of Jesus' parable is to point to the Father. We focus on the brother. We focus on the, the, the youngest It's all about the Father. And it's all about the Father's table. And it's all about the invitation to come, no matter what we've done, and receive His grace and His forgiveness and His love. But we need to also invite the Father in to help us break some of the chairs that have been keeping us from the table. We have to allow the Father to come and tear down some of these strongholds that keep us from the Father's presence. I don't know why I want to jump over that table and karate kick it, but I think I'd break a hip. So I'm just going to walk over and go, we need to tear down those tables with the power of God, the victory of Jesus, and we need to understand where we're spending our time away from the Father and say, God, forgive me. I want to be with you. I want to be with you. I don't want to be anywhere else. And it's not about me. I don't sit there because I deserve it. I sit there because you love me. The father ends the discussion in verse 32. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. 
Do we have the heart of the Father? Are we connecting to the heart of the Father? Are we living our life about our perfect Heavenly Father? Abba, Daddy, loved us to send His Son, adopted us through Jesus Christ. Sin is no longer who we are. We've been set free. We are no longer destined for hell and separation from God, but because of Jesus Christ, we are His sons and daughters. We are co-heirs with Christ, and our home is in heaven with our Father. I'd like to close with a scripture, Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 4. He has taken me to the banquet hall, and his banner over me is love. I like the translation. It says, he's brought me to his banqueting table, and his banner over me is love. To be thankful is to receive God's love and to be changed by God's love. To be thankful is to understand that we don't deserve a place at the table, but his love makes a place at the table. The Father is inviting each of us to come. He forgives us for sitting in the chairs that we've talked about today. He wants to forgive us and break those sinful chairs that have been holding us back. He loves us. He's made a place at his banqueting table. He saved us a seat. Will you come? We're going to get ready to sing a song of invitation. Before we do, I'm going to pray for us and The song I I think is fitting. The song is called No Longer Slaves. You see that mindset of the older brother? I've been slaving away, right? Well, we were slaves to sin. And if we have not accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are still slaves to sin. But through Jesus Christ, we are a child of God. That's who we are. And that's where we need to be, is in the presence of the Father, in the grace of the Father, and in the love of the Father. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for each one. God, I just love them all, and I just pray that you speak to them. And God, as you've taken me through this message, you you have just kicked over chairs, and even chairs I was sitting on, God, and, and you just rattled my heart and my mind to be able to see where I have been because it wasn't in your presence, in your grace, in your love. God, please Help each one of us through your Holy Spirit to see what keeps us from surrendering to you, what keeps us from worshiping you, and what keeps us from being joyful always, praying continually and giving thanks in all circumstances. For it is your will through the power and the victory of Jesus Christ. May we see where we are and by your grace come to your banqueting table, because your banner over us is love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.